let's uh, say you're up there. Thank you very much. And do you want to start? Or a circle? You can have a circle. You can have one of each, actually. And we've got five more minutes before three o'clock. Has anyone got a, what they feel is a shortage example that we can talk about, or should we stop now and have a break? What do you reckon? Stop now and have a break? Pause. Thank you. Got a... Just have a question. Sure. Yeah. Yes. What's your question? Yeah. Um, Tristan's got a... Just um, regarding the law of attraction, when um, uh, wanting to get the difference between when I see something or when a parent sees something reflected from a child, that's the law of attraction of the parent reflecting what's in the parent. Yep. Now, what in the situation when my law of attraction brings me something from an adult yep. or from a circumstance? Um, just an example in my own life, um, when I was um, like in my late teens, early 20s, I would go out surfing. Yeah. My mother had, would often voice to me this fear that she had about sharks and all sorts of things. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to get clear if that's my law of attraction, my mother is saying that to me. How does that relate to the child saying something to the adult in the reverse situation? Um. It's always both people's law of attraction, obviously, but the fact that your mother is saying it to you, it is her fear that she's saying it to you. If you didn't feel fear about going surfing, but she was projecting fear on you, then it's obviously just her law of attraction. Does it, do you follow me? If you don't feel the feelings she's actually reflecting to you, then it's her feelings, not yours. And this is how, like, I know in my own interactions, whether it's somebody else's feelings or my own too, because because you'll get to a point in your own progression where you've dealt with a lot of your emotions and somebody will still come to you with something and you and you will not feel anything from it and, and so you know that it is their law of attraction. Okay, so so there's if I'm not feeling anything that uh, then it may have if I let's see. The so, feeling you may have had with your mother then which would have been your law of attraction is yeah. I have to do what my mother thinks even though she's crazy and she thinks that I'm going to get eaten by a shark. That would have been the feeling you would have had. So it would be to look at my feeling of annoyance or whatever about Exactly. And obviously, um, when I said just earlier that it's not anybody's, you know, it's, it's, it's never half of a person's or one person's law of attraction. Every single thing that happens is due to the combined law of attraction of every single person involved. But what we often do is we say, oh, well, if my mum was angry, that means that I was angry. No. If your mum was afraid, does that mean I was afraid? No. Because you've got to feel what your emotions were in that transaction. So if your mum projects fear at you and you got angry, then there is some emotion inside of you that you're denying at that point as well. Does that make sense? That this law of attraction of your mum telling you is going to help sort out if you, if you let it. So in every single interaction, our law of attraction is that both of our law of attractions operating in harmony with each other to trigger something in each one, or even to trigger some truth, or even acknowledgement of truth in each one. It doesn't necessarily have to trigger an emotion. So there might have been a truth you needed to face in the issue, and that is you don't need to do what your mum wants. You know? And that's an emotion that you're still really dealing with in a lot of ways in, in your own life. You're working your way through that issue having to do what the woman wants. Yeah, well, there's, there's been a number of things related to that where I felt like um, I had to do whatever my parents said. In yeah. Place. yeah, and so, and so mum projects fear at you and she's afraid. You automatically felt that you'd have to stop surfing and you didn't want to stop surfing, so you get angry. So allow yourself to feel what's underneath that. There's a feeling of, I have to do what mum says. So look at that emotion underneath that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But, but her projecting fear doesn't mean you're afraid. So her saying to you, oh, I'm afraid of you getting eaten by a shark, doesn't mean that you feel afraid of getting eaten by a shark. But it will mean that there is something inside of you that transaction triggered that you do need to release. 
especially if I'm feeling something as a result of that. Especially if you're feeling something. So if you feel a twinge of frustration, anger, annoyance, any of those emotions, straight away you know, I didn't feel something in that transaction. I was just going to say, if you were five and you were saying to your mum, I'm afraid of sharks, then that would be her emotion. But as you, you're older, the law attraction channels Thank you. All right, what we'll do now is have a break for a half an hour or so, and then we'll come back to the spotlight there. Myself, uh, obviously Tristan's my son, he's my eldest son, so uh, for those of you who haven't met him, this is Tristan Miller. You've all been with me. Yeah. Um, and what I wanted to do is just uh, work through, show you some of the emotions that myself and Tristan have worked through together. Um, and what actually happens now when I'm working through emotion, even though Tristan's 24 years of age. So we, we want to discuss some of those issues together. And uh, my beautiful Mary needs some way to see the So uh, what we'd like to do firstly is just, uh, I was going to let Tristan talk about some of the things that have happened during his childhood from his perspective so that you can get an idea of what kinds of things he's had to work his way through and then I'll try to uh, look at things from my law of attraction perspective. Alrighty then. <laughs> so my pass. Yay. Um, <laughs> if you didn't already know, um, when I was uh, uh, from when I was born to, to when I was 18, I was in a uh, religion. I was Je Jehovah's Witness and my dad was a an elder in the congregation and my mum was pretty avid Jehovah's Witness and our family were very respectable kind of kind of thing going on. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, a lot of my life uh, I remember as a kid getting smacked a lot because there's a feeling, in the, there's a saying in the Bible that to use your rod on the child when they're, when they're being and to, to help them learn. And there's a, a lot of uh, emotion about being smacked when I felt that was very unnecessary. Uh, there were times when I wanted to get some sugar out the sugar jar and it really, uh, really tested my mother's emotions and so I got smacked at that time. And also when, uh, while in the congregation I was, uh, Sometimes I'd speak up or be what they consider naughty, if far less than uh, even the kids here have been today. And I really love seeing the kids running around and, and talking about their stuff because it's just been awesome. But uh, I was, used to be taken out the back and then smacked and then brought back in once the tears were, were gone. I remember the dad being the main perpetrator of that one. And there was a, a lot of anger and a lot of um, angst about it. But the fact that I don't feel like I could not express myself at all, especially when it came to God. There's a big emotions down that. My big emotions I felt came, uh, well, I don't know if they came from this time, but they, uh, the bigger law of attraction events happened to me when, uh, when Dad and Mum actually split up when I was about 13. Uh, that, was, that was quite interesting at the time because at the time, I felt it was like a bit of a game. Dad's going away on holiday and me and my brother get presents. For the first time in our lives, we were given video games. And, and it was hard to be upset that Dad was leaving when we had a Nintendo 64 just given to us on the same day with two or three games. I, I didn't quite understand what was going on and, uh, until I was actually living with Mum without Dad there that I un understand how my life had actually changed and I didn't understand why and I didn't understand how and I was very confused. And later on, um, it, it got to a point where it felt like I was being pulled between two parents and also between my religion. Uh, in the religion, uh, there, it's not really a rule but more of a, more of a thing where if someone is disfellowship or disassociated and you shouldn't really be spending time with them. And, uh, I felt under pressure, on, I don't know how much pressure they actually gave me, but I felt under pressure to be spending less time with Dad and talking less with Dad about God and about those kind of things. And that would be, was pretty hard because Dad loved talking about God and he loved talking about the Bible and I felt like I was basically being, 
was being bad to go towards God by listening to my father about these things. Uh, it got to a point where where Dad would have deeper meaning, try and have deeper meaningfuls with me and my brother, and nearly everything about them I really didn't want to be around. It, uh, I, I would go around, I'd be around Dad, and like what he said made sense, and then I'd go home, and and then I felt like my everything he said was a lie, and what my mum now was saying is made sense, and then then I'd go to Dad, and that, then everything that was said there was. It was a constant back and forth, and I was so confused about what was actually the truth and what was not the truth, and what was mum saying about the dad was, was that the truth, or was what the dad saying about his his stuff and what he actually had to do is that the truth? And in the end, I decided that both parents were lying to me, and I decided not to trust either one about anything after that point, and I, I still have some emotions to do both with both with dad and them about trusting them and trusting what they say to me. Uh, it got to a point where I was so confused and basically just, I was really angry that I had to go through all this stuff and, and no one was helping me and, and Caleb was trying to get me to, to help him as well and uh, we were both very confused and probably a little brother Caleb was a year and a half younger than me. And uh, we came to a decision, uh, we, I felt there was a pressure from from the religion and my mother, I came to this decision to actually to cut off talking and spending time with our father. Before then, we would actually go to his place and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, we uh, we had, actually we actually called him up and told him we would no longer spend any time with him whatsoever, and that uh, he may still call us, but we will not call him. I did that when the age of 15, and my father was in the age of 13. It was the, at the time I felt really good about the decision because it was like cutting a, a problem out of my life where I didn't have to deal with it. I could get rid of this problem. That I don't have to deal with my relationship with dad and mum would be all fine and religion would be all fine and all would be fine. But then uh, the actual phone conversation when we did that was the most harrowing, I think it was about three hours of conversation we end up having. And then uh, like dad's asking why and we don't really know why. We just we just feel that has to had to be done. And then the dad was so distraught that he ended up travelling all the way up from where he was and also like talking to us for another few hours and it was basically the hardest one of the hardest days of my life and I still have not processed through that day. I still I still feel like I still I still have process any remorse about that. I, I still have anger towards dad that I need to go through. Uh, at, at 17, uh, by that time, my life had got pretty pretty cagey, and I felt like like the religion was killing me, or that I was killing me, or something inside me was dying, and slowly. It, uh, it hurt so much that I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn. I spent uh, days in a small granny flat on a computer and I was sick nearly every day. Uh, sometimes the sickness would be so scary and so painful that I thought I was dying, which is a weird thing for a 17 year old to go through. I felt like an old man, which was hard. Uh, I had a, uh, a friend come from a, another, another state and her family may stay with us. And she started uh, being nice to me. Like, it's the first time that someone outside of my religion has been nice to me. I, before then, I'd been pretty much tortured emotionally by nearly everyone around me. But uh, then I went to a new school and uh, I made new friends and I actually learned that people outside the religion can actually be good people. And before then, I, I thought that uh, everyone outside the religion was somehow pathetic and I was somehow better than them. And it, it really uh, slammed my whole life's how I look about my life. It, uh, I realised that 
At, the, at, a, at a time, I, I started pretending to be a person to these people so that they would like me instead of... Uh, and at that same time, I was pretending to the, to the religion and my family that I was a different kind of person, so they would like me. So I was pretending to be re rebellious and a little uh, dangerous on one side, and the other side, I was, I was a good little Christian boy who everyone respected. And I, I, somehow I, I kept that going for about two months before before I re realized that I was lying somewhere and that almost everything I was saying was a lie. It got so bad that I started believing some lies and that I didn't know what the truth was. And I got so confused in the end that I had just a mental breakdown and the whole question of who I was just came through and I, and I just stopped going to school, I stopped going outside my room, I stopped doing everything. For about two months, I was in that room and I did not come out. And that was pretty hard. Um, and in the end, uh, I decided to leave the religion while still believing in it. And they believed that if you, if God does not believe you're worthy, then you will be Basically, if Alligator came, you would be you know, you would be executed by God. You would be what's the word? God's poor boy, basically. So I, I I felt like leaving was basically a suicide, and I did it. I, I, I lost all my friends, all the ones that I thought could care about me. I lost a lot, large part of my family that I I had spent time with that I thought loved me, and. Uh, I was asked also to leave the house. That was mum. And uh, I ended up calling up dad, who I hadn't talked to in three or four years, and he accepted me over straight away. And I spent two months at dad's processing through a lot of that stuff. And at the same time, though, uh, as soon as I had made that decision to get out of the religion, I was. I was jumping for joy. I was actually skipping and singing again and doing all the things that I like to do. And before then, I was, I was basically nothing. <laughs> then I, I ended up living with Dad in SA, and uh, Dad organised a job for me, and, and he looked after uh, my expenses along with Caleb, who moved in with Dad before that. He, uh, Dad in SA had, even when I, there's sometimes when I didn't have a job. SA of South Australia. Sometimes when I did not have a job, and sometimes when when Dad wanted us to deal with, uh, help us deal with our emotions, he gave us vast amounts of living expenses, and he gave us like housing, housing to live in, and we were not grateful at all. We, we were using Dad completely at that time, and we didn't seem to realise we were pretty happy because we were learning about ourselves and I was having a lot of fun because I got out of a religion where you can't do anything so I started doing as much as I could. Um, but at the same time, I, even now, I still have this emotion where I'm still ungrateful for some of the things that that has given me and shown me. And a large part of my life with Dad in the SA was him paying my bills and, and, me, and me just not like, keeping crap. <laughs> And so, and right now I feel that I still feel bad about that. Uh, on a side note, when Dad told me that he felt he was Jesus, uh, that wasn't a big deal to me at all. A lot of people have asked me, how do you feel about Dad being Jesus? And I'm going, it's not a big deal at all to me. Uh, it's like someone coming up to me and saying, hi, I'm John. And I go, okay, well, I'll trust that until you show me otherwise. <laughs> so. <laughs> Dad comes up to me and goes, yeah, I was at Subway. And he said, yes, I feel, I feel like, like I'm Jesus. And I'm going through all these emotions and having memories and I'm going, okay. Um, of course, I can't, until you prove it to me, I can't really believe it wholeheartedly. But um, it does put into light a lot of the facts that mum used to say, don't do that, I'll, that wouldn't be what Jesus did. Or Jesus will be watching you. Or Jesus loves you. <laughs> and all those kind of things just raced up uh, and, and it's like, yeah, okay. And some of the things, especially when the dad and mom broke up, where dad took us to movies that she didn't want us to watch, she said, Jesus wouldn't let you want to watch those movies. <laughs> he took us. <laughs> uh, 
So I'm a bit worried about that being Jesus. Um, and the more I've dealt with my emotions, the more I've actually accepted it without any proof as in healings and stuff like that. Like, I go through my own stuff and I just realise that he is and it's not a big deal other than the fact that I know that if I want some truth, the best person to turn to will be my dad. And I can always count that if I'm, if I'm desiring to get into emotion and have an actual desire for it, that the first thing to be, the first and best thing to be doing would be dad. <laughs> Call up dad. <laughs> and he'll tell me. <laughs> Uh, Dad decided about two years ago to come live in here in Queensland. And uh, at the time I was living one of his houses and, and working always. And I decided, because I, I knew that he would be away for six months and then be in a bit of a little bush, that I would, would actually want to start dealing with my emotions properly. I actually want to deal with things and talk about um, and desire God. So I said, yes, I'm going to come with you. And Dad was a little bit, I don't know, I don't know if he was freaked out by it or not. He just thought, wow, I didn't expect that. And uh, so, in the end, it was, the actual moving process was harsh, hard, because Dad was in a different country and I had to organise, well, I felt I had to organise it all. And I, there were so many times I could cry, so many times I could process. The drive over to Queensland, the Dad in the car, was the most triggering thing I've ever done in my life, and I still didn't process a bit of it. I could have got through so much anger, but I didn't. And it was, oh, I look back on it now, I'm just going, that was just so sort of stupid of me. But in the end, I, I rocked up to his place. Dad went off to, to around the world on this, on this trip, and I went crazy and dealt through huge amounts of alone emotions, I went through huge amounts of how that felt about myself. I got to a point where I went through some, uh, some I don't know if it was grateful or some stuff about women, but there was some, there was some anger there and fear. And I realised I, I, like, I realised emotionally I should get a job. And a week later I had a job. And that was like, so weird for me because that was the first time I actually processed emotion and, and had a feeling and it actually happened straight away. I felt pretty good about that. And it, was, it was pretty good. Right? You, you can never underestimate when, when you put yourself out there to trigger your emotions. I suggest doing it as much as possible. It's the only way you're going to get to stuff that you, you've never had before, you never thought that you had. And so I, moved, I got to a point where I realised I needed to move out of that zone. That happened only like a few months ago. <laughs> and this has been the most horrible experience of my life emotionally. I've gone through, I just had a full-fledged desire to connect to God and, and make it about me, not about me in relation to what my dad is or what my dad's doing. I've, I've spent days, like hours a day, crying and processing and feeling and, and screaming and shouting and, the people that I've been staying with have been really wonderful about it. <laughs> and also sometimes it's triggered them and they've gone through their stuff as well, so it's been quite good. But it's, uh, it's been really, it's been amazing. I've, I've processed through much more stuff in the last two months than I've done in my entire life. And I feel really like some days when I get out, get through an emotion, I feel amazing. And I can express that as far as best as I can. And I have a lot of fun. People see me have a lot of fun. And, and, I also got huge amounts of stuff to do with. I got some big self disgust with myself to do with women, and I've got some big anger still to do with with men. So as I as I go through that, it's been pretty good. Um, I I don't want to stop processing, even if I end up in a, in a mental asylum. <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, with, her, with Tristan saying all of that, I'll talk about some of the law of attraction from my perspective. Um, Obviously, you can see straight away that Tristan's, Tristan's had quite a difficult life in some respects, right? And, um, and one of the emotions that I felt a lot was that uh, as it, once I came to a memory of all of these different truths that I could now remember, one of the first emotions that I had was a terrible feeling of guilt about how I brought up my sons. 
And so particularly how much I use corporal punishment as a way of controlling their behaviour, uh, which is a big, big issue that Tristan uh, had to work through, and so has Kate. I still feel that to, to get ahead of life, I have to suffer. Yeah. So, um, like, so I had to work through lots of feelings of guilt and shame, the law of compensation type emotions that you work through as a parent. And even events like um, when my boys phone me to talk about their, uh, when they talk, told me that they couldn't speak to me again. And I went through some pretty big emotions there. And I, looking back on it now, I can see what all the law of attraction was for myself. But um, I, can also, I also did see at the time why they wanted to not contact me and spend any time with me anymore. There was just so much pressure on them that, uh, about me. Uh, because I left a religion that if you leave the religion, basically you're condemned to death, basically, by the religion. And you're treated as if, in fact, they encourage you to encourage people in the, in the um, religion to treat you as if you've died. And so you, you would like walk along the street and all the people who used to be your friends would just walk straight past you and, and look at you, but not, not acknowledge you. And, and so uh, that many would walk along, you know, they'd see you and go across the other side of the road and walk past you and things like that. And my, my own family finished up doing that with me as well. This was all happening at the same time. And then, and then of course, uh, my boys started getting lots and lots of pressure to not speak with me and not communicate with me. And, you know, I can see now that, in fact, that I had to get into this state where the with my own emotions. And, uh, and so that was all my law of attraction. So it, it even saddens me now when I hear Tristan say you know, that he still feels guilt about his decision to not speak with me when, when I see it quite strongly as my own law of attraction. Um, so there's a lot of, there was a lot of events that occurred all the way through um, my own processing that I had to work my way through in terms of how I treated my boys, the kinds of things that I did with them. The things that have hurt even more are not so much the corporal punishment issues, but the issues where it's a lot more insidious damage to my sons. And one of those pieces of insidious damage was when I taught my boys that you would always be considerate to a woman. So no matter what the woman does, and no matter what the woman says, and no matter how she treats you, you need to continue to be considerate to them. And I've only recently, about a year and a half ago, probably worked through the core of those emotions. And what I'm noticing now is each time I work through a core emotion, Tristan, within a few days, even if he's on the opposite side of the world, works through that emotion. And because, of, and what I found is that, like that core emotion for me took, has taken me nearly one year, but with Tristan it takes him only a few months or less so to deal with it than it takes me. And so what I'm noticing is the more I release within myself, the easier it is on Tristan in his, in his dealing with and releasing process. And the same goes with my other son, Caleb, who's not consciously choosing to, at the moment, to actually release emotion. He is still releasing emotion as I'm dealing with emotion. And so that's uh, an effect that's happening automatically. So there's been lots of guilt, there's lots of shame as a father to work my way through. So I can relate to many of you who feel like ashamed of yourself as parents and the things that you've done to your children to control them or, or to keep them what you thought was bringing them up appropriately. And there were also many emotions that I taught them through my own behaviour. And I think they are, from, from my perspective, that being the most damaging to my child, to my sons. The people most sons to process them. Yeah, because it, you know it's quite obvious that when you smack a child, the child feels bad about that, and the child feels it's wrong, right? Quite different to have this insidious emotion of always wanting to please a woman and you don't really know why inside of yourself. And so I've had a lot of emotions to work through about the kind of damage I've done to my boys in uh, causing them to act certain ways that they were unconscious of at the time. And so like Tristan's had a number of girlfriends which, uh, and some, quite a number of them have treated him 
in quite unloving ways, but he's felt like he's deserved that because of my own uh, example. And so I've had to work through a lot of those kind of emotions. And what the beautiful thing though is between us is that as I work through an emotion, he shortly after works through the emotion in a lot shorter time frame, and and it also brings us a lot closer together. So now we're we're, we're like brothers. We're actual friends instead of being fearful. I had so much fear of uh, being around Dad that I, I used to act like a child, like a I'd start talking baby talk around him and not really understand why. Yeah. So now we've we've got this relationship. It's more like brothers. And uh, like I feel he's my brother, not my son. And uh, and Tristan feels like I'm his brother. And so we uh, do things together and enjoy each other's company just like brothers would. And uh, and also because we're both passionate about dealing with emotions now, um, Tristan and myself both find it quite easy to work through emotions now. So it's really that's really a beautiful blessing that's come from all the changes that we've had to work through. Really good. So there's been there's been a lot of difficulties, and and during the time that I was uh, dealing with a lot of my own emotions, um, obviously when you as a parent deal with your emotions, then your children are not receiving the projection. It's when you hold on to the emotion, your children receive your children are receiving the projection. And so the time that I first started dealing with my emotions was 11 or 12 years ago, and from that time on. Uh, it was easier on the boys to actually make their own choices. But five or six years ago, when I really firmly started dealing with my own emotions, there were huge changes in the boys in terms of what they felt they could do, how they felt they could live their lives, and so how we felt we could express ourselves. Yeah. You know, we could express ourselves. Yeah. So just my dealing with those emotions and owning everything caused some major changes within my sons without them even realising what was going on at the time. I want to talk about a bit about the girls. So one, of, one of Tristan's, obviously both parents in the fear, so one of Tristan's emotions is about women. One, and one of them. <laughs> obviously I've had some really big women issues to do with in my life, right? And, uh, and it's only quite recently that I've come to understand what they're all about. Uh, but as I've dealt with those, Tristan's life and with his relationships has changed quite markedly as well. So that remarkably you can tell the difference one from the other. I mentioned something? Uh, sure, I just want to say first firstly, um, I usually uh, only attract two types of women. Uh, usually the there's one who is glamorous, everyone loved them, they were beautiful, everyone cared about cared about them, that kind of thing. And uh, then I get the the second type which are down to earth girls who are still very beautiful but but not really conscious of that one that downplay themselves a lot and who feel quite bad about themselves. Um, in both types, I'm always attracted to either them physically or emotionally feeling horrible about themselves and I'm supposed to make it better. So uh, a lot of my earlier girls that I didn't really have any relationships with have been me trying to fix their lives or fix what's been happening. I'm attracted to some one or two girls that had horrible home lives and, and I tried to fix them, which is really hard to do for, for a teenager. So, <laughs> but I suppose I could just go through. My, uh, there were three biggest ones, the ones that I thought were major parts of, of my life. So let's go through. Well, if everyone wants to hear. Do you want to hear all that? Go. <laughs> um, the, first, um, the first girlfriend, who was just after I got our Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I felt I hated and unwelcomed by her father. I was liked by her mother, but tolerated by her siblings. I basically felt, I felt unwelcome to be around her, and as, as if I'm somehow far lesser than, than what she deserved. She always needed me. She needed my time, my energy, my space. She needed me to go towards her, and I felt like good about that. I felt good to be needed. She felt bad about herself and how she looked and how her soul was, so I spent most of my time helping her see how good her soul was and how good she looked and all those kind of things. In the end, uh, I just was had a hole inside myself and I wanted to fill it up, so the best way to do that was 
getting these emotions from a, from a girl and seeing her grow and, and thinking it's me doing it and, and hoping that it's me doing it and when she didn't grow then it's something wrong with me and all that kind of stuff. A year passed and I was changing emotionally and I realised she hated me. <laughs> I realised that most of my relationship with her she didn't actually like me that much at all. And it, it, it intens as, as her need intensified and I stopped giving her things, it got pretty bad and in the end I just had to end it. And so, at, at the same time as I remember that although there is are bad things about the relationship, there were good points in the relationship too. They were, they were, they were what we would consider average relationships. Well, what well, most people would consider average relationships. As the second girl was a bit different. Um, she was quite uh, smart and uh, I wanted to basically help her get through her emotions because by this time I was starting to deal with mine and I projected huge amounts of anger and need on her to deal with her stuff and then she started, well she wanted to, in the end she just started arguing back because you know, I was basically pushing her to be something that she didn't want to be and in the end well, it got quite interesting. Uh, I decided, I dealt with enough emotions to realise I was trying to change her instead of being accepting of her and after, after, uh, I, after so much crying I, I ended up breaking that relationship up too. Uh, a third major relationship that I had, she was pretty, she felt pretty bad about her worth and she compared herself to me on every level and felt that I was completely, not completely better but I felt that I was better than her and I deserved someone better than her, someone that looked better than her, someone that acted better than her. And and I was spent my time most of the time trying to make her feel that, that she does deserve me and she does deserve this kind of kind of relationship. And i in this one I actually felt I actually felt that I got someone who shared in my want of emotional releasing, even though she at the time went through some stuff and not others. So I, I felt that, uh, that although I was uh, being super, still being super Tristan, the, the white knight, and trying to help the, the girl, I was doing it far, far less. I, was, I spent a lot of my time owning the emotion instead of actually projecting it on her. And then uh, it went back and forth. She broke up with me quite a few times. and. And by the, by the end of it, I was, I was just thinking, this has got to stop, I can't keep doing this, I can't keep making this, these choices. So I decided to, to go through that. Oh, there was one last emotion that I didn't want to go through because I felt that it, it would end if I dealt with it, and I did. And then I, I ended up romantically disconnecting from the, from the girl, even though we're still pretty good friends. And uh, in the end, I, I, I feel pretty, I feel pretty good about relationship because it got me through so much of my stuff and, and I did feel like I felt some sort of love, even not so much love as before. So you can see the pattern that Tristan had too with women was, and this is very much related to his law of attraction with his mum, is that um, there was a lot of wanting to please and so you can see I also had an emotion of wanting to please women so that was, that you know, I taught Tristan a lot of this, uh, these things. And then because his mum was a person who wanted to be pleased, um, obviously that was doubled, even the injury sort of doubled up. So he ended up with this huge emotion of just wanting to please and be considered true with women all the time. And, uh, and when I dealt with my emotion about it, he was drawn into a relationship pretty much straight after that helped him deal with a lot of his emotion about it. So you can see that again, there's this linkage, even though Chris is 24 now, there's this linkage between my emotion and me dealing with my emotion and then Tristan dealing with his emotion. And the more I want to deal with my emotion, the stronger that linkage seems to be. Mm. Like the quicker it happens and the better it happens. So, so if I deal with something today, oftentimes with, with now that Tristan's in this space where he wants to deal with his emotion, if I deal with something today, generally within the next day or so, Tristan will ring me up saying, oh, I've been dealing with this, you know, what's going on, you know? What have you done recently, he says. Because <laughs> a lot of times, uh, exactly what I've just dealt with is exactly what he needs to connect to. Um, as parents, as you're doing through your stuff, like, seriously, it'll be, 
you don't know how much help you're giving your kids. Not only for like, how much pressure you take off their shoulders, but also as you go through your stuff, when they want to go through their stuff, all they have to do is ask you, and you can just tell them, and they'll go, ah, oh, good, let's do that then. So that makes it a lot easier. It's a lot harder if the parent doesn't deal with their emotion and the child then has to do work through theirs, which is what many of you are facing, right, in your own lives now. The parents are not, your parents may be not working through the emotion and you're having to work through yours, and that's a very, really, very really hard job. So you can, as a parent, one of the best ways, rather than go into your guilt about your children, one of the best ways that you can help your children now that you know all this is to actually start processing your emotion as fast as you can possibly process it without guilt and without judgment, without, you know, without shame and those kind of emotions. As you do that, then it helps your child straight away. It helps you, you, no matter what age they are, it helps them straight away. So one thing I've uh, worked with my way through, I've prayed a lot to God about forgiveness and repentance about how I've treated my children and I had to work through a lot of that emotionally. As I worked through that emotionally, um, there's been quite big changes in my sons. And then, and then as I've dealt with each emotion, because of the connection that, that's broken then between myself and my sons in terms of the codependent connections, they then deal with the emotion very rapidly afterwards. So it's a very good thing to keep in mind if you can, those things. Is there any questions you'd like to ask, Chris? And what was the last emotion? So what was the last emotion Tristan had to work through with a girl? It was, it was actually an emotion about soulmates. I felt that uh, I felt that my last relationship was with my soulmate, and I felt that uh, that she, that because she's my soulmate, I must be as, as best as I can and go through all my stuff and everything will be better and I should stay with her as much as possible and try my hardest in the relationship. It actually came from Dad. Um, it's a motion of self-blame. It's been a best thing that to mine. Dad has actually said to me, this is something I want to say to anyone who, who thinks about soulmates all the time and, and puts a lot of energy into it. If someone, if someone treat, what's that? Would you put up with someone treating me badly if they are not your soulmate and you knew it? And why do you put up with someone who you feel is your soulmate and doing the same thing? So, in the end, I, I had to actually go through a whole lot of emotion of like, just, just, I just had to say to myself, wow, well, I, I wouldn't put up with this who should be. So it was an emotion of worthiness, really, that I was learning through. With, with what he believed was his soulmate. And it's very much my emotion to do with uh, my loss of soulmate emotion that I had all my life that's been such a powerful influence in my life all the way through. Uh, and and uh, I've had huge amounts of grief, like years and years and years of crying to do about those kind of issues with my, soul, with my soulmate before I even met my soulmate. So, so I had these huge longings for my soulmate all my life and these huge emotions of grief associated with the loss of her which then got projected onto my sons. And so, uh, so Tristan's had to deal with a lot of those projected emotions, which meant that he felt so bad about himself when it came to his relationships with women, and, and particularly if it was one he believed was his soulmate, that he would not actually stop behaviour that was unloving towards himself. And that's exactly the issue I have to face as well. Yeah. From what I'm understanding, you were actually processing emotions before you had the realisation that you were Jesus. Yes, yeah, so I started processing emotions seven years before I had the realisations of who I was. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to release huge amounts of fear, terror, lots of uh, traumatic experiences all related to my first century life, um, but I didn't understand what they were. So, so what happened was when I started processing emotion, um, I had a lot of uh, memories of being nailed to, to a wood, to wood, and 
been um, being raped and a few other quite a lot of other memories associated with that that I that I couldn't place because I couldn't remember the events of my current life, but they were memories that had these huge amounts of emotions associated with them. And so I had to during that period of learn that I just had to process the emotion with the hope that someday in the future I would actually understand what it was about. And so the first seven years of my emotional processing, I had no idea what emotions I was processing or why they were there, and I couldn't understand them at all because all of them were about torture and abuse, um, and I couldn't understand any of them. So I, I just I just allowed myself to continue processing those emotions. Um, and as I did that, I became more open and open, more open emotionally. During that period, I got rid of lots of my terror and my fear. And once I got rid of quite a lot of my terror and my fear, that's when I then that's when the other memories of why those original memories were there kind of started coming to me. So while I had some memories, um, I had an event when I was two years of age where I where I trod on a nail that went straight through my foot, and then I had memories. Then I had memories when I was in my thirties, still not aware of who I am, of of. Uh, being nailed to a to a wooden plank and and, um, and having a spear put through me and things like that, things that I just couldn't place, but they all had emotional content, so I had to just release the emotion, and I just trusted the process of releasing the emotion, and and then I had other memories of torture, other torture events that have happened in my life, uh, and then uh, rape-based events that happened in my life and the life of my soulmate. Um, so I, I did, I dealt with a lot of those emotions before I even knew who I was. And I had no idea what I was, why I was dealing with them. But I just knew that every time I released one of them, I felt better. So I knew that I just had to keep going. And so it was a very hard time, if you can imagine. Uh, during that time also, nobody would speak to me, my family wouldn't speak to me, uh, my boys didn't speak to me for nearly two years. And so it was a very difficult time. Would you call that faith? Yeah, I suppose it, it is faith. Um, to, the faith that, you know, in the end, everything will work out. Um, I, just, I just knew that every emotion I dealt with, I felt better. So I had to just keep dealing with these emotions that I did not understand. But they were in me, so I just had to accept they were in me, no matter what they were. And so that's what I did. I accepted they were in me, no matter what they were and process through some pretty intense emotions. Um, just like, for instance, the terror took, took three months. Um, I had these fits uh, twice a day that lasted a couple of hours at each time. Was, the, the only way I could liken them was they were like cramps in my entire body. I'd be curled up on the floor because I couldn't move. Um, trying to breathe, and a couple of times I actually passed out and was taken to hospital. And um, so, like, that was my terror experiences, which lasted three months. Um, and this was before I knew what I was doing. Like, I didn't know why I was doing it. It just was happening. And, uh, and so that happened for the first seven, six or seven years, and then, uh, probably six years, and then once I'd worked through lots of those emotions of fear about my own identity, that's when I was ready to start accepting the other memories that actually told me my own identity. <coughs> It's a bit like all of your childhood is locked up inside of you. All of your memories of your childhood are locked up inside of you. And when you allow yourself to feel them emotionally, you will remember them. That's what I have. At one point, uh, um, one point I want to make is that although I wasn't there for like the, the first like the first bits of dad processing, seeing dad processing through, uh, through when I was living with him and uh, when I was around him, that was made it much easier to get through my own stuff later on. Uh, there's a lot of times when you're dealing through fear and grief and, and anger and as you know you're pretty scared about what's happening to you and how uncontrollable it is and how uncontrollable it is and, and how loud it is and what you're doing as a person. And your kids will, will go through their stuff later on and realise that that's what you were doing and feel a whole lot more I suppose faith and, and feel better in themselves about doing the same thing and knowing that it actually will help them as well. Mm -hmm.
So obviously Tristan's seen a lot of changes in me during that period of time. When I uh, left the relationship I was in with his mother, I was physically, like, constantly shaken, like I had Parkinson's disease. So my, I actually, I was 33 years old and shaking like this all the time. So, if you can picture, like, that was the amount of fear that was in me. I was actually now, and people would always comment about, what, what are you shaking for? And I'd say, I don't know, it's just how I am. <laughs> and that's through the stages of 17 days. Yeah. So, so, I was so locked up with emotion uh, that, uh, that started coming out. Uh, once I was in a space where I was by myself and could actually allow myself to feel it. So, for many of you, being in an alone space is actually a great benefit to actually dealing with emotion. Because in an alone space, you don't get projections. So, while I was alone for a lot of that period of time, and felt quite lonely all of that time. Uh, I didn't receive any projections from people, so that was a real blessing. <laughs> uh, I could actually feel my emotions. I, I know if I was there right in the start, I would be projecting project pretty harshly. There was one time actually when Tristan came to stay with me for a while, live with me for a while, and three months later I had to ask him to move out because he was actually trying to shut me down and predict it with my emotions. And this was about Probably four years ago, I suppose, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was pretty late. It was, it was probably a year or so before we left to come here. Yeah. So it was like three years. So, so uh, I invited him to come and stay because he wanted to do with his emotions. But within a few months, I could feel his projections so strongly that I said, to him, we're going to have to live in separate houses. So he moved next door. <laughs> and then I, uh, I could feel free to do with my own emotions. Um, now what I'm doing is working through dealing with my emotions no matter who is around and how much projection I get. So now I can see it into emotions quite easily no matter who is around and how much projection I have from them. full rage, 
and she's going to reflect in, at, she's reflecting perfectly at you every reason why you're not doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think I was aware that I said I'm not finished with this, and um, and I said I might go away to do it somewhere else, and I, I'd like well, at least a week or whatever. And she says that's okay. I'll find the neighbours or I'll go there. And I thought she was really, you know, very complying with the idea just to get me out of the house. <laughs> So, um, anyway, we're talking about what we can do about that. Oh, awesome. She, she is reflecting perfectly at you your blockages to experience it at your age. <laughs> it's another balloon, by the way, for the people on the table. Um, she's reflecting at you perfectly the blockages to dealing with your age. And, uh, and the key is to take notice of that. So you have a fear of how your neighbours will feel about you expressing it, or, or you know, how other people are going to react. You also have a fear that you're actually still projecting it to your family. That's a fear you have. Right? As she said, she's not feeling it as much, but the whole house feels it. And that is very true. Until you get into the underlying causes, which will be the grief, the whole house will feel your anger. Once you get into the grief and feel it, right? well, once you get into the rage and feel it completely, the whole house won't feel it then. But you'll need to step into the grief as well underneath the rage. Is there any other questions? Thanks, Mary. Um, my question is about your relationship with God. Was God always there as you were processing your emotions? Or was your concept of God something that you learned about from organised religion and then as you processed your emotions, you discovered he was there anyway? Yeah, what actually happened was I had a very strong, I've had a very strong desire for God all my life, even as a child. Um, but when I was in my 30s and I left the religion and was, and was basically condemned by the religion, I actually felt that I was also at the same time condemned by God, which is a similar emotion to what Tristan has had to work his way through. And so for the next six or seven years, I felt so totally ashamed of my any feelings that I had about God and and I, I couldn't connect to God very well at all. So for that period of time, I dealt with my emotions without connecting to God. Did yeah. he connect with you? I'm sure, I'm sure he did. Because as, as time went on, I learned a lot of things through the emotional release process about God. So I had a viewpoint that God was punishing, for example, when I left the religion. But within two years, I knew God wasn't punishing. And how I was taught that lesson was when my boys just told me they would never speak to me again, I had lots of grief to experience and I went through three or four months of grief about that. But then after I went through all of that grief, and even while I was going through it, I realised that I didn't hate my boys. I didn't want to punish my boys. I didn't want to I didn't feel bad towards them. I didn't feel like you know they were to blame. And then I thought, you know, I related that to God. And I realised that, oh well, even if I do something that God doesn't want me to do. God's not going to punish me for it, like God still loves me and I still felt this deep desire and love for my boys. So, so um, it taught me a lot through the entire process. Most of this was done alone, of course. It taught me a lot through this entire process um, that um, just about God. And so during those seven year period where I was working through all the rape emotions, the, the abuse emotions, the torture emotions, I was also working through this issue about God, reconnecting into life with God. And so by the time, by the time it came to, for me to be ready to actually feel a lot of the emotions surrounding who I was, by that stage I'd already worked through all of these emotions about God. So I knew God was love and I knew God was going to love me through the process. And do you know what I mean? So that by the time I actually hit the emotions of who I was, I also have dealt with a lot of the emotions about God as well. Um, so how does God guide you now or speak with you now? Um, the way God speaks to all of us is through our emotions, not through our thoughts or, or, or through hearing. So if you're, if you're feeling that you're hearing God, you're not actually hearing God, you're actually, what's happening is God is transmitting an emotion to you and then that emotion gets translated by you and by your filters into thoughts which you then can, can hear, if we can use the term hear. So the way, the way God's connecting with me at the moment, and this is going to change soon, 
the way God's connecting with me at the moment is by by the feelings. So God is leading me through feelings, and I can feel that leading occurring. And I can also feel, as I talk to groups, I can feel the channeling of information flowing through uh, from myself, but also you know being led through this connection with God through to people. So. You'll find in the end, when you become one with God, you feel God's feelings, and they are God's thoughts. Does that make sense? Like, the truth is that God's thoughts are actually all feelings. Right? And, and when you get into a condition where you are totally open to all feelings, and you are connecting to God and desiring God's love all the time, you will feel God's feelings all the time. So that's that's how God will communicate with you. Any other questions? Josh? Um, as a, as in your situation, you've got a parent who is um, supporting you. Uh, if the if the mum was not, is she working through the same things? No. So it's okay. With just one parent working through um, all these emotions, uh, it's it's harder to work through a, an emotion about mom still. But I do have I've gone through enough stuff where I feel the energy to be able to do that. Must work through a tough change. Okay. Um, the question was if. If one person parent's doing it, is, is, does it make it? Uh, is it, if one parent isn't doing it, does it make it harder or easier or whatever? Um, I find that my dad's emotions far easier to get through, take far less time. Um, my mum's emotions, uh, my emotions do about my mum and the codependency there, a lot harder to go through. Um, I've still got some really horrible stuff that I need to go through, and I keep getting reminded about it through some dreams lately. So. Although my mum isn't willing to deal with her emotions yet, and that's okay, that's her choice, I do feel like I've gone through enough of my stuff now to have the energy to plough through those emotions and, and deal with it from, from that side. It's, it's been far, it's been, like even just having one parent is far better than, than no parents at all, because I have the confidence now to process through my stuff. If dad hadn't processed through his stuff, or even started, I, there's, there's a very good chance I would never have even started at all. And I would, if I had started, it would be far more time and, and far harder to get through. The, the fact thing is, the fact is, Dad's been very honest with me about some of the emotions he had, and I've been growing to be more honest with him with some of my emotions that I've had, and that makes it far easier. So don't underestimate your own power as a parent even if the other parent is not there. And at the same time, you're supporting them through the other stuff as well without projecting your emotions from the other parent as well. So dad's never actually projected, or I never felt that dad's projected his stuff with mum on me, making it harder to get through my stuff with mum. Um, for Christian, how, how, like, what's your relationship like with God now, do you, is that a very real reality for you emotionally? And does it happen, like do you have divine love coming to you often or is it? Um, I feel like I've got divine love coming to me often. It's grown from a very small wispy thing to a very real tangible thing. I, I can wake up and feel like I'm going to be a one with God soon. I, I know that God's there now. I know that God's in my life. I know that I'm that God loves me. And those things, like even a year ago, like, were never part of me, were never part of my, my personality. I, I'm so gung ho God now, and, and yet I still don't feel like that Nancy, Christ, uh, Nancy Christian boy that I was back five years back. I, I feel like I'm myself, and, and I still do the things I want to do, but, but God's still there in my life. Like, people get, um, especially friend, new friends I make, they get a bit. They get a bit weirded out that like, I'm, I'm the personality that I am. Uh, I'm a bit outrageous sometimes and I'm a bit happy and then I get very serious emotionally. 
and then I'm always talking about God and and, and not, never trying to push pressure God onto them. And that's new for people, I suppose. And how about you, AJ? Do you, um, like, is it every moment now for you to feel God or is it just after you've done a bit of emotional stuff? Um, in terms of when I feel God's emotions, that's usually when I've worked on something that's just been released. So, so I'm still releasing emotions. So what happens is that I feel God all the time, but um, I know that I'm not receiving divine love all the time yet. And, and particularly I'm going through some emotions of self, uh, self-loathing type emotions at the moment as well, which, which Tristan's obviously going through as well. Um, so uh, while I've got those emotions, there's a, there's a blockage between me and God, and so I can feel that blockage. But even if that's the case, I'm talking to God constantly through that process. So, so every single moment, pretty much, of, of most days, I'm constantly communicating with God about where I'm at right now, how, you know, how can I face this emotion, what I'm asking God to bring me a yeah, law of attraction event so that I can face it. Like, I'm getting quite a lot of them in a rapid succession occurring, um, so much so that some days you know, it's hard to get some sleep <laughs> because of the amount of law of attraction events. But, but what I'm finding now is I'm really right down at the core now um, of my own emotional processing and, uh, and feel that quite soon. Uh, there's sort of like this one big core emotion within me that's been chipped away at it at lots of different levels now. So my relationship with God, though, is just like, um, God's my dad, um, and or my mum. I often think of them as even, and, and I, I'm constantly talking to God all through the day. Even while I'm speaking with you, I'm often feeling my feelings about God through that process. And what I've noticed in Tristan, too, if I could comment about how Tristan has been, about two years ago, Tristan sort of had a consciousness of God's existence would be the best way to put it, but not a real emotional connection with God. And then over the, it took him a year of emotional processing nearly before he really started having really strong feelings about God and a desire for God. And now that he's feeling, like now, probably five or six months ago, I started feeling, probably even maybe not that far ago, I started feeling a really strong passion in Tristan for God. And now, like I know he talks to God all the time and, and has this pretty constant relationship going on, even though at times he feels very blocked. So, and because I've got that kind of relationship, I can feel his relationship no matter where he is with God. So, so he can be, I've been overseas and been feeling how Tristan's doing when he's in Australia, and I can feel when he's connecting with God and when he isn't. And also, that when you're communicating, do you still, like, do you find yourself saying in your head the words of what you want to say to God as well? Yeah, and um, what I try to do is I try to make my whole being in line with what I'm communicating with God about. So that means my thoughts, my emotions, all in that one direction. Yeah, what I find there are sometimes during a day where I can actually have feelings without the thoughts, but the majority of times still, if I'm, particularly if I'm in a stuck or in a stuck location, which I have been on occasions over the last few weeks. And what I've done then is I've still tried to keep my thoughts and my feelings directed in that direction, even though there's been these other pressures uh, and the blocked emotion. And just even just praying about the blockages. I, like That's why I keep re recommending to everyone, keep praying about your blockages. Keep praying about God showing you what's stopping you from feeling, uh, because that, that's been really helpful for me. I find that... Uh that talking to God, even when you feel that there isn't a God, helps. Talking to God and being honest as you can, and this applies to even in relationships around you, being honest as you can, even if the honesty is, I really hate you, <laughs> you do that with God and things will, will ease up so much better and the, the, the sort of relationship with God will come easier and the emotions will come easier. So a lot of it's about being truthful with God too. So I'm constantly trying to be truthful with God, like, yes, this is how I feel. Own up to how you're feeling on a pretty constant basis. So I find, what I find about talking about it with God is a lot easier than actually owning it up to yourself sort of thing. It's like, 
when you talk about it with God, you, you're saying, yeah, I can see, thanks, God, I can see that that, you know, just like having a conversation with God, I can see this emotion in me now, what can I do about it, you know, and, uh, and allow myself to just con continue in this constant dialogue with God. Uh, and then, as you do with the emotion, you feel God's dialogue in return. And so, you know, as you release the emotion, you feel a very strong confirmation that, yeah, that was a cause of emotion. No, no, you're not there yet. You need to go further. And, you know, there's deeper emotions you need to go with. And, and also now I'm feeling a lot more of God's love in the sense of um, feeling protection, feelings of security and protection from God. So, you know, in the last few months I've had people... I know in our audience at times there's been people who've been urged by spirits to kill me and I can feel that urging to occur but I feel actually quite safe myself because I can feel that protection that God's given me at the same time. Thanks. Very first, I don't like. I don't. I, I see it as a law of attraction event that is contacting me. Yeah. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And the first question I ask myself is, "Have I dealt with that emotion?" And sometimes I haven't. Like I haven't dealt with the emotion that he's identified for me. Yes. Uh, and so straight away I try and get into that stuff to, to help out the situation. Right. So the key is that anything that's coming to you is your law of attraction. But anything the child is experiencing mm -hmm. is your law of attraction. But as they get older, sometimes the, what the child is experiencing is based on also the choices that your child has made. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and obviously the child's attraction or attraction is based upon their father and mother, not just their mother. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously in Tris's case, for example, I've been able to work through a lot of my emotions about women, and I've been able to work through a lot of my, my soulmate-based emotions which Tristan has worked through, but there's still some issues with his mum that need to be worked through uh, that I can't help him with, really, because they are issues. Yeah, so you're helping Tristan by working through your emotions that are in his law of attraction that become his, but it's harder for Tristan than any other child or adult for that matter, yep. to deal with emotion coming from the parent who actually isn't working with their emotions. Spot on. Right. Yep. So now, now I'm getting into um, us, all of us, the children, and we, what we have in us is the law of attraction we've actually inherited from our parents. Spot on. And if, say for example, my parents were like, they're, they're not, yep. if they were actually dealing with their emotions, then it would be easier then for me to deal with mine. Yes, and that applies even if they're in the spirit world. That's what's my next question. Yeah. So if your parents are in the spirit world and they chose right now to deal with their emotions, it would make it easier for you to deal with yours. Right. So I could, in fact, well, they might actually be here, I don't know, but yeah. I could invite them to um, the come to your thoughts and learn about the divine love part. Yes. Uh, and that would actually make... Your emotional yeah, processing work easier. Yeah, easier. Yes. Okay. It would. <laughs> yeah. um, but what if they decide not to? Well, then I have to do it on my own. So you, you need to ask yourself that question too. Why am I wanting my parents to do it? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, so you see, when I'm, a, when I'm an adult, I'm, when I, once I hear this information, I'm tempted to say, I would like my parents to do it. Is that emotion there? You know, and we start, there, there, is, a, there is a issue there mm -hmm. that we may finish up getting down the track of actually justifying us holding on to anger or blame with our parents rather than actually dealing with our emotions still. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so certainly what you say is true, 
but don't get seduced now yes. into waiting for your parents to deal with their emotions yes. before I, you do with yours. I see that, but I also see that as a, as a wonderful way of actually helping my parents. As, C certainly. You know, yes. in, 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 in the spirit of them to, yep. to, um, to do the, the one love part. Yeah. And many of your parents have come along and listened with you. Many of them, of course, think it's uh, rubbish and so they don't want to hear any more. And so they've left, you know, and then, and, but many of you have had parents with you and you know you have at times. And they've da da dealt with the different emotions in the process. So, um, so it's a good thing to do, but don't delay your progression based on their choice. See, the, the thing that all of us need to come to a point of awareness about is if I delay my progression waiting for someone else to change, so this is particularly what happens with anger. You know, anger is expecting someone else to do something for you, right? So you're actually expecting someone else to change for you. Now, as soon as you do that, as soon as you're in that space, you have now slowed down your own progression. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why do that? Because in some cases, some of the people that have hurt you may be in the spirit world for a thousand years before they decide they want to deal with their emotion about it. Are you going to wait a thousand years? Well, obviously you don't want to do it. So, so no matter whether your parent wants to or not, still go into your stuff. But what I'm suggesting with you now that you know this information, if you have children, understand this beautiful linkage that occurs between parents and children that you can greatly assist them to do with their emotion. Um, I've got to a point now where if that stops, I will even though I believe Jesus, if that stops, I will not. I will not stop processing. And, uh, and also with my mum as well. I know she doesn't want to do with her stuff. And I've, I've got like, some, uh, some projections sometimes whenever I'm talking to her. But again, uh, that will not stop me from what I'm going to deal with. So, and that's a fantastic place to be. When you're in that place where you will not stop this process for anybody, you are now connecting with God a lot because that's you're you're now becoming totally reliant on your relationship with God through the rest of your life, which is, is exactly what should be the case because God is your parent. Remember, that's one of the principles we talked about yesterday. The first thing we talked about: God is your parent. So I'm not Tristan's parent. I'm just this guy who, you know, had sex with his mum, who created this beautiful creature. That's the most sexual. That's the most sexual. <laughs> He has a body. He has a body like that I created, a spirit body that I created through that good looking body too. <laughs> so he's got some good self worth now about his body, which is better than his father. It took a while. Yeah. And then, but the soul of Tristan is my. He's my brother. He's not mine. He's my father's child, and uh, and and I did a lot of damage to this this person in my life. It's not the big one, like, you know the. We can make a, a big brother program and they get all of them. Yeah. I'm his big brother. <laughs> and I did a lot of damage to my little brother in my life, which I've had to work through the law of compensation about, had to be repentant about, and had to work through all of my emotions about. And so, uh, and that's why now we have a relationship that we have. If I chose not to work through those things, we wouldn't have the relationship we have. And, uh, and also, that's benefited him. It's important to see that relationship, that it's benefiting him now that I'm working through all of my stuff. But I did a lot of damage to him too, and I've had to own all that. That's been my royal compensation. That's what I've done. And I had to, I had to own that and work through that emotion, just like you would have to with your own children. Well, thank you, Tristan. What, there were a few others that wanted to come up. Um, so we want to ask a few. Now there's people pointing at people, but does that mean you really want to come? Now, have a, now maybe if Mary can swap over with Tris, so Mary can join us. Tag team. Yay! <laughs> and you can come up and sit in the chair. And talk to Mary first. Oh, oh listen.
Yes. So, yes. so I, I think I've gotten to the point where I You look good on me, maybe. Mind if I talk about it? Do you want to stay? I'm going to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Dad's really great. You know, by the way. Um, do you notice if we admit our anger very rapidly, we can get into what is underneath the anger? So that's really good. The feeling, obviously, you have is that your dad could have taken you away from abuse, from an abusive situation. And he chose not to. And uh, and you feel that what what was wrong with me? With that? Why why did he do that to me? Like why did he not take me away? Now it's going. There'll be a, there'll be a time if you can allow yourself to feel that anger and rage. That's that's important to do. But it's important to also drop underneath that emotion and really feel that terrible sadness that you feel about of self blame about about the whole issue as well. Because what's that, what will happen if you stay in the anger is that, is that you'll be just be angry with men and angry with dad for the rest of your life. And the key is for you to now let yourself work through the emotion of how so sad you are about being abused and not having someone rescue you. And not having, in particular, your dad rescue you. And just allow yourself to feel that emotion. You're doing really well, actually. I know you're just a question, but you're just a bit embarrassed about it. Stop crying when you're going and crying. But, but if you could just, when you, if you ever get this video again, just to play that little section of your time, that'll help you reconnect with it. It's really big emotion for you, as you said. But you've identified other four things. There's a flip side to it, and that is that you feel about, what you feel about yourself, about your dad leaving. So there's things you feel about dad, but, but that's the reason for the anger is there's actually things you feel about yourself, about dad leaving and not taking you with him. So that's that's where the core is for you. Does that make sense? I think you can move forward. Yeah. You're going to get to the worst thing. You'll get to the worst thing, yeah. Um, maybe 
Linda? You don't want to come up, do you? I get this feeling you just don't want to come up. You can ask a question. I just realised my dog was really unhealthy to me. All the others are out having fun and being kids, and I've got parents here. Yeah. Which, yeah, it's really good. So, yeah, it's really good. I thought it was nice that she was sitting here, then I thought, no, this is not right, this is not. Is there a question? Yeah, why, why should I have been? The blunt answer is your daughter is mothering you. She feels that you need to be mothered. So there's an emotion in you where you feel like you're not the mother, you can't be a mother. And so she's just reflecting that emotion at you. You feel like you don't want to be a mother. And your daughter is mothering you because of that emotion. So she's not allowed to be the child in your presence. It's not like I think that I want to be. You, you don't want it to be. You want some because of that emotion inside of you, which is I don't want to be a mother. You're now creating a situation where your daughter has to mother. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and Kaya does feel quite upset about that. But but she feels there's no choice. Does that make sense? And that's why she's been angry with you, and it's understandable. So if you can let yourself feel about that emotion, then. it's about it's about you feeling like you've missed out. It's a very big, strong emotion in you, feeling like you've missed out on your child, you've missed out on being, you know, a teenage girl and an, and an adult woman having your own life. It feels like you don't have your own life. Is it? There's a lot of childhood emotions associated with you not feeling like you have your own life. Does that answer your question? Perhaps not how you want to put it, but that's okay. And at the other time, it's not You can come up with your mum. That's <laughs> okay.
expressed herself so wonderfully there. Um, and very, very clearly. And you can, and, if, and for those, and before I talk with Karen, um, as, can you see what happens to the child when the child has to take on a parenting role? So Anna felt like she's lost all sense of self-identity. She feels angry, but she's not allowed to be angry. She feels like she, you know, she's shut herself down in a lot of areas and, and tried to be exactly what mum wants her to be and so forth. And so there's a lot of emotions in there. Very, very powerful experience, actually. You know? And you're connecting with it really causally, <laughs> which is wonderful. So, and it's very good that you could say those things to her and, and risk her. Yeah, I doubt whether mum's going to get angry, but yeah, yeah, obviously in the past, you probably know that that's going to be the case. Yeah, I've been wondering that all day, and um, since I felt it, and, and I've just felt sick and just so fearful. And now I feel like I really want to be sorry and tell mum that I'm sorry and give her a hug because I don't want her to feel bad. I don't, I don't feel like I want that. So you don't feel you've done it to make mum feel sorry or anything. It's just this is just an expression of how you feel. What I'm going to do is get you to avoid giving mum a hug, yeah. so that uh, we can talk with mum. Right? So that's uh, that's important. But and what's wonderful in terms of what you, you do, you connect with your emotions so well. And what's wonderful is when you when you realise things, you act upon them fairly truthfully right at that moment. And that's a very very powerful work for you. So it's one, and you treat it quite a number of different people in the audience, which is really, really good. Because a lot of us have these emotions, you know, where we've had to do what our parents wanted us to do in order to make everything happy and get love from them. And that's a big emotion to work with. So we're doing great. Can I talk to you about this? Yes. Really. So what do you do with that? See that as a prevention rather than as a cure. 
it will work really well. So what, the, what you'll be tempted to do is to actually get into depressed mode. Depression is the suppression of what's underneath. And you'll be tempted to feel depressed in this place. So, so the feelings I'm feeling from you at the moment are one of let, let me be by myself, let me go into myself, into my shell, and I'll just, I'll just go into myself. Oh, I'm terrible, I'm so bad that nobody will ever want me, and nobody will ever understand me, and you just go right into the. So if, if you can act it out, it's like you know, curling right up, right up, like you know, and, shut, and holding in there and just trying to stay away from you. That's the feeling inside that you're being acted out. And it's a very childhood feeling. And if you allow yourself to go a little deeper, you realise that it's actually what you, it's one of the first coping mechanisms you ever learned was to do this. How to get away from all of this expectation that was placed upon you by your family. And so you are right, how Anna feels with you is exactly the same as how you were treated by your family. But rather than going into this withdrawal state, eventually what you'll need to do is do what Anna is doing now, and that is have a big cry, write about it, you know, talk to them about it, in a sense of write about it, and actually have a big cry about it, let yourself connect with how much it's hurt you in your life, rather than withdrawing into the hurt and staying in the hurt. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, but myself to not feel for the same reason. Um, I just keep trying stuff. Do you, do you remember that God's here with you trying to help you open up. Now I know you don't believe that in your heart yet, but you do know that, that God is around and can help you through this process. So remember just earlier we were talking about talk to God about how you're really feeling inside and start expressing it. Start you know, expressing how you really feel. Don't lock yourself down. Because this, this mechanism of locking yourself down prevents you from expression. And, and if you're not expressing, then what happens is you're not you're going to be able to connect to the emotion. So, so you, you know how you feel really shut down now, like really wanting to withdraw? The best thing to do is start saying it. Like even if you say it in a book, you know, write it in a book. I'm shutting down now, I'm withdrawing, I'm, you know, even if you write it there without anybody around, that's better than leaving this all, this all emotion unexpressed. Because if you leave this emotion unexpressed, then depression will be the next result. So, and you don't want to get an depression if you can avoid it. You want to stay in a place where you can at least be open enough to connect. And if you allow yourself to do that, you will connect. And you've got your beautiful girls around you who can connect pretty easily. And so so you, you, know, you can see what a connection is as well, so that they can help you a lot with that. I often think that, you know, Anna and I are living in the same house at the moment, but I often wonder if that's a good thing for us. Well, the fact is it's your law of attraction, so it's a good thing for you. So she can, you can actually learn a lot from Anna at the moment. So she is very, very connected to her emotion. I'm very aware of that. I know how good she is at all of this, but um, it's very scary living with her too. I suppose I have to just be scared. So you so you start working through your fears about it. Allow yourself to see what you're afraid of, what you're afraid of. When you see Anna having a cry, what are you afraid of? I'm just afraid of her anger really. Well, oh, she might not even be anger, but I'm very sensitive to anything that might turn into anger. Yeah. So I'm just afraid of it. Whenever she's not happy, I'm very nervous around her. So the key now is to go, let's say she gets angry and you feel that. That is your law of attraction. So what do you do when people get angry? Well, just as we described, I don't know. Yeah. So, so now start doing something different than that. So start, start trying to stay open and start expressing yourself. So when you look, if, if somebody's getting angry, you start expressing yourself. I don't know if I can cope with this anger. 
you know, say, like I'm starting to shut myself down. And Mary maybe can help a little bit, because that's something that was happening with you a few months or so ago, wasn't it? Just shutting yourself down when somebody was angry with you? Yeah. yeah, I think having a realisation that that's what was happening and just talking about even that, like saying, oh, I just can't cope with the, the anger that's coming at me. Were there, was there some times in your childhood when people were very angry? My father had um, angry outbursts, but they were never directed at me. I was very still not sure they were directed at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they obviously scared you quite a bit, and that's why you made sure they weren't directed at you. Yeah, yeah. So maybe even if you can connect with, like, some, to start to talk about that, maybe. To, even if you talk about that, in oh, writing, but what if what you remember about that, how you felt at that time. Yeah. The shutting down thing, I, it took me a while as well. I just had to keep reminding myself, oh, shut down. And I, I was reminded by the person I'm living with as well that I'm shutting down, I'm withdrawing, you're shutting down, withdrawing. He wasn't directing anger at me, but it was coming at me from other directions and I would withdraw so much I'd disconnect from myself. I wasn't even there, really. But so, it really, and it was kind of painful to get through that, to, to go, okay, stay open, stay open, stay open. Because it felt quite um, powerless, I guess. So. See, every time you shut down and withdraw, you're actually shutting down from yourself. You're actually trying to get away from one of your own emotions. So it's not actually... So when, when somebody's angry with you, if you shut down because they're angry with you, it's not because they're angry with you that you're shutting down. It's because they're, when they're angry with you, you feel an emotion that you can't let yourself feel. And that's why you shut yourself down. Does that make sense? So their anger is just the trigger to the emotion that you want to shut down, and so you shut down. So it's very important to see that every single thing that's happening external to you triggers you, and what you do with it is your choice. Right? And your choice at the moment is to do exactly what you did when you were little, and that is go straight away into shut down. And there's a temptation in you to then say it's because of Anna's anger. It's actually not because of Anna's anger that you learned this response. It was because of your dad's anger that you learned this response. Does that make sense? And so if you can, if you can just practice staying open now, and if Anna does get angry, stay open. Let yourself feel. So rather than closing down, the feeling you feel is hurt. So cry rather than closing down. Does that make sense? I think it's fear. Yeah, but under the, what are you afraid of? You're afraid of what? What does she do when she's angry? Well, yeah, she's only in the too. You're afraid of being hurt, yeah. So, so say that. I'm afraid you're going to hurt me, Anna. Right? And then if she's still angry at you, just feel like what it feels like to be hurt. Just feel that. Let yourself feel that right there and then. Does that make sense? It'll help you connect a lot. I feel the two of you being together is a great kind of blessing. That's why myself and Tristan spent quite a few years together. Because uh, it was a great blessing for both of us to get, a, get through some emotions. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Do you want me to lose gold star? Oh, I don't have Anna does. Does Mark want a gold star? Oh, You'll have it for oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> is there any questions about that, Joshua? Would you like to? Um, is there a mic? Yeah, yeah. Um, Joshua, you're talking about um, shutting down and shutting down. Is there a mic? Yeah, yeah. Um, Joshua, you're talking about shutting down and shutting down. That's all right. I'm keen to put my hand up to get up there and share a few things. Awesome. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. I'll just put it
quite a few things come to me while I was, while I was in that emotion. And one thing I really feel really strongly about now is just the truth. And every moment, just being totally honest with yourself. And that's a good place to start with anything. And I feel a bit you know, afraid up here at the moment. So what Anna was saying, uh, really connected you with some of your own truth about your own childhood? Yeah, yeah. And, and while that was happening, I started having memories of what was what those emotions were about. Awesome. Yeah. And um, I also had a few, so it was almost like visions of, of the future. And like how it's almost as though, like at the moment, we've got fires and floods and cyclones raging and things starting to happen like that. And I can't help but feel like in my heart things like, it, like that are going to get worse. Yeah. And I just felt like saying to everyone that what better thing to do when you've got nothing else to do and you've got no control over anything yeah. than just show how you feel about it. Because if the world's falling down around your knees, what else is there to do? And, and it just felt like crying is the, is the only thing you can do and you feel very real when you're in that. Yeah. And that's, that's what I wanted to share. Awesome. And I feel that actually you were given a bit of guidance there from a spirit who uh, gave you some of that information. And it's very, very important what you said because what, it, what often happens is that when we're in this process where our emotions are flowing, some realizations and revelations in fact come to us. And one really important revelation for the future is a lot of the world events that are going to happen are going to happen just for the point of actually helping people work through their emotions. So a lot of attraction. That's it, yeah. Yeah, so that's fine. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thanks, yeah. It was good to be connected to him, Josh. Yeah. And it's 5.30, but I'm happy to continue for another half hour or so. But myself and Mary do have to drive home tonight, which is a three-hour drive for us. Um, would you like to come up? Um, since I was like five or something, um, my dad's been an alcoholic and has been smoking. Uh, since then, it's have had a lot to do with my life because he hasn't spent a lot of time with me. And he's like, like some kids have had a good childhood with their dad. Like they've played like football with him and all that, but I, I don't think. Yeah. So it's really, it, it really hurts because he, he should, he should spend more time with me because he, because, like, like, I'm a guy, so he should, like, play something or, like, spend some time. Yeah, spend some time, like, one-on-one action and all that, and I don't get that. Yeah. So, yeah. So you'd really like to have sort of like a dad show interest in you. Yeah. That's the feeling. Yeah. So how does it feel not even not showing interest in you? You feel really sad. Do oh. sometimes you get depressed and down about yeah. it? Or, yeah. yeah. And and what do you feel when you with when you with mum then too? What's the feeling to have that? Um, I feel she's had to live with that as well. Yeah. Sort of live you with you being sort of upset about what's going on. Yeah. 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 So, so, um, so how, how old are you, Mitch? Like? 13. 13, yeah. So, um, what do you feel you can do about it? I suppose that's the, that's the question, isn't it? Have you given that any thought at all? I could process my emotions and just cry about it. Yep, so that's one thing you can do. One thing, though, is you really, really would like a male male person to spend the time with, wouldn't you? Yeah. Is that what you like? Yeah. So have you thought about, there's a thing called the law of attraction, you heard a bit about that? Yeah. Right? And so if you exercise a really strong desire to have a, man, a male spend some time with you in your life, and you just allow yourself to pray to God about that, about, so your dad's not doing it, yeah. and you don't know when your dad's ever going to do it, right? Yeah. 
and you're pretty sad about that, so it would be a good idea to have a cry about that. Yeah. But then after you've had a cry about it, have a desire for some other fella to come along and actually spend some time with them. Do you follow me? Yeah. Do you think, like, yeah. you know, like someone who can do some things you like, what are the kinds of things you like doing? Yeah. So, what kind okay. of things do you like? Oh, you too! Hallelujah! Oh, I. Oh, sport? I like. Mucking around? Yeah. 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 Do you um, live down near, near the beach? Do you live in the Sunshine Coast or a prison? Yeah. Yeah, Sunshine Coast? Yeah. you like the beach and stuff like that? Yeah. 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 It's all cool to teach me surf. Yeah? Yeah. So that'd be cool? Yeah. Okay, so so what you can do is exercise your desire, let yourself feel a desire, and what will happen is the law of attraction will bring you somebody who will actually fulfill that role for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can do that. And so that's one really positive thing you can do to actually have a person. See, at the moment, there's two, so there's two things you can do. One is grieve the fact that you've lost a dad, really, that dad is yeah. not with you. But the next thing is exercise and desire that you actually have someone replacing for you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's going to mean working through some emotions that you've got. And okay. it's also probably going to mean mum needs to work through some emotions about dad not spending time with you too. Yep. So you know, we can talk to mum separately about that. Okay. But it, they are the two things you can do. And things can change really rapidly when you do that. Yeah. I've seen people who are 13 years old changing their life in one week just by doing some things like that. Yeah. So when you're young, it's really powerful. Yeah. So do you reckon you've got some ideas now? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Now, where's your mum? Is she here? Yeah. You want to come up, mum? <laughs> come on, he's been brave, so now it's your turn to be brave. You get a sticker. You get a sticker, yeah. Okay. Now, you know this is related to your relationship with your father. Yeah, as well. One of the reasons why. Mitch hasn't attracted another man into his life right at the moment in order to fulfill this feeling or need that he has is because of some of the emotions you have towards men which are to do with grieving about your relationship with your dad. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you allow yourself, if you allow yourself to grieve about some of these things about men in your life, what will happen is it will help Mitch greatly to actually use his law of attraction to have a guy in his life that wants to do some things with him that are fun. Yeah. So, so as you were sad, that'll make Mitch freer to feel his sadness about his dad. And once he's through some of that sadness, then his law of attraction will get you know, much more powerful. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you both. Thanks Mitch. Thanks for being brave, mate. That's good. I'll go to the mic. Stickers? Do you want stickers? Yeah. Ah, yes. Mum wants a sticker. Mitch might be too much for a bit. Yeah. 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 One is that I've just been, so, it's just been so good hearing from so many of you today. Al already many of you who haven't been able to connect to emotions, just from seeing other people and, and hearing some of the things that they're feeling, you can see the power of that. It's so powerful because it helps you connect with your own emotion. So I, I feel it's been a pretty good day in terms of helping you work your way through some things for, for many of you. I'd also like to thank our children, who most many of whom are not here now, but uh, for uh, for actually being brave enough too to come up. You notice too. One thing I'd like to point out is how readily the children generally come up, and how unreadily, if you like, how much resistance, how much resistance the parents have towards coming up. Well, why is that? Do you feel? Can you see how our children can teach us so much about just being ourselves? and just being the person we are inside? And can you see how often, how shut down we are to just being the person we are inside? 
So if there's only one positive message you'd like to say, it's look really clearly at your children because that's what you're going to become like in the end. You're going to become like these spontaneous beings that are full of joy and laughter and want to be outside playing rather than being inside here learning some intellectual things. And you will get the same way. You will actually get the same way in your own progression. And to not be afraid of that, that's a beautiful space to be in. And that's also the space where you're going to connect to God the most if you desire to connect to God. And this is a learning process for all of us and exploration. And if you watch the way children learn, it's through experimenting. They're not cynical. They give it a go. They don't care where the information's coming from. They just want the... They're happy to be learning about things. So we can, we can learn from them in that way. So if you can just keep those things in mind, I know we haven't been through a lot of the second half of the outline that I gave you yesterday, but have a good look at some of those things in that outline because what it will do is help you become more spontaneous, more acting, acting on your desire, and bear in mind that every single thing your child is experiencing is a result of the law of attraction event for you. And if you can keep that in mind, you're going to find progression a lot easier you know, through, through your spiritual progression towards God. And if we are a child, we'll also find that dealing with things openly and honestly, like many of the children and, and teenagers here today have, can be a lot, uh, is a very fast way to connect you with your emotion. You notice how rapidly the children, each one of the children connected to their emotion, and you notice as an adult how how much more slowly most of the parents connected to their emotion? Did you see that contrast? That's what you are going to become like, those children who connect with their emotion just by saying something, straight into the emotion. And so uh, that's where you're headed, and I think that's a beautiful place to be. The more I get closer to that place, the better my life feels, and I'm pretty sure that yours will feel the same way too. So myself and Mary would like to thank you both. Thank you for coming today. And uh, we've just got to do some tidy up work afterwards. If, if you can just hang around for 10 minutes, it won't take that long, just to tidy up the chairs and so forth. And uh, the next time that we'll see you will be next week. Um, for the hot topic. For the, oh yeah, the hot topic that Peter said of oh, sex and sexuality. So bring along your fans. And, uh, and I was thinking of bringing along some sort of raunchy music just to get you into the zone. <laughs> Uh, and we'll see how we go with that topic next week. But thank you very much for listening this afternoon.